I'd like to thank everybody for joining us for this conversation. Today, I'm excited to have a conversation with two people that are both great scholars and have done great work for the church. And also, I feel, even though uh, to, to me, they're, they're, they're some of those folks that are way up here because of what they've done, they've been kind enough and humble enough to call me their friend, and I appreciate that. So today we have uh, Dr. Jerry Taylor and we have Doug Foster. Jerry has actually been at Cenotopia Church of Christ. He's, he's spoken here before, so he's a familiar face. If you will, Jerry, just say hi and wave so people can see you. Hello, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. <laughs> Jerry's actually from close to here. He's from Memphis, so he's kind of from our neck of the woods. We also have uh, uh, Doug Foster, and Doug has not been here to speak, but he's familiar to, to many of you because we watched his story of the Churches of Christ last summer as a congregationally, as a study. Uh, Doug is actually from my original neck of the woods. We share the same original neck of the woods in, in Colbert County, one of my favorite uh, my first probably real interaction with Doug, someone introduced him at a, an event in Memphis and said he was from the Florence area, and he corrected them real quickly, because us, us Colbert County boys do not like to be associated with those uh, people from Florence. So if you will, Doug, just kind of say hello. Hello. So glad to be with you today. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Doug. We're actually moving into a conversation today that is serious and uh, troubling and, and difficult as we in Churches of Christ, and particularly in white Churches of Christ, struggle with how to deal with the racism and, and white supremacy that exists in our society. So I want to, before we even move in to this conversation, to ask you to frame your mind as one that's willing to be challenged. And if you hear something that makes you angry or pushes you back, I want you to think about that as a, as a red flag, because what we're talking about today is how to love our brothers and sisters better. And if that causes you to experience anger or fear, then there's something within your heart that you need to pray about. So I just want to suggest as we start, if you have any of those experiences during this conversation that you'll take a moment, even hit pause if you need to, and, and, and pray and ask the Holy Spirit into your heart and make it through, because we ought to be able as Christians to have this conversation together. So with that said, I'm going to ask Dr. Taylor, if he will, to give a fuller introduction of himself, let you guys know a little bit more about him, and particularly what got him involved in the work of racial healing and why he's so passionate about it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'll try not to take too long. Uh, <laughs> I was born in a little town uh, north of Memphis, uh, about 36 miles north of Memphis, a little town called Covington, Tennessee. Yep. Um, we lived there in 1968. I was seven years old mm -hmm. uh, when I heard my mother screaming to the top of her voice. Mm. Uh, in the living room, and as I rushed in, I saw uh, Walter uh, Cronkite mm -hmm. announcing uh, the news that Dr. King had been assassinated. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a seven-year-old kid, <laughs> at that time, uh, I knew that something major had happened, and uh, it was major enough to impact my mother so deeply until she reacted as if one of her closest family members had, had died. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so that, that impression um, has remained with me to this day. Mm -hmm. uh, living in abject poverty in Tipton County, mm -hmm. um, going a day or two without knowing where we would get our next meal from, mm -hmm. having to move. 11 times in one year because my mm. stepfather who only had a third grade education mm. would often get in altercations with the white landowner uh, mm. who worked. Uh, and so having experienced intense racism in West Tennessee, mm. uh, Tipton County in particular, um, uh, kind of shaped my whole worldview. Mm. 
at the age of 11, my grandfather passed away. Um, I was one of uh, uh, his grandchildren that helped carry him to the hospital mm -hmm. at the age of 11, my uncle Wardio. Uh, and it was after his passing, uh, a few months later, I saw Eyes on the Prize uh, mm -hmm. with uh, uh, the civil rights movement. And I mm -hmm. saw older black women being uh, knocked to the ground by uh, you know, the water hoses there in Birmingham and police dogs unleashed. I saw all of this and uh, just my young life rolling up to age 11 and 12, I realized that I was a part of, of a group of people that was despised because of the color of our skin. Mm. And so um, I decided that I would preach. I wanted to uh, be a leader uh, dealing specifically in the area of social justice and uh, racial justice, racial equality. Uh, as young as 12 and 13, I preached my first sermon at the age of 14. Yeah. My white English teacher, Mrs. Merle Durham, uh, got news that I had preached my first sermon. Yeah. And she asked me to deliver that sermon in her class. It was a public high school at Millington Central High School where I was in high school choir with John Timberlake. Uh, Justin Timberlake's uncle. Yeah, <laughs> is that is that true? <laughs> Absolutely true. Just Justin Timberlake is from Millington, yeah. Tennessee. He tells people he's from Memphis, but he grew up uh, in. Uh, so, uh, so I had I had a very, uh, very good experience at Millington Central High School. About two thousand students there. Uh, majority white, but we had a good uh, diverse population of students. Um, the, you know, I was almost uh, the pivotal person on a race riot at Millington. Mm -hmm. uh, young white guy and I got into uh, a match of slap boxing. Mm -hmm. um, I slapped him pretty hard. <laughs> he balled his fist up. Mm -hmm. and, uh, he was no longer slap boxing while I still was trying to slide box and he cut me over my eye, blood mm. went everywhere. And all of the black students at our school uh, demanded that I fight him. And, mm. uh, and so there was uh, this whole ordeal of uh, their uh, being on the brink of a race ride at our high school. Mm. Uh, having been uh, known as a preacher and having had talked to several of my classmates about being a Christian, I knew that that would do great harm uh, mm. to reputation as a Christian and as a minister uh, that I had just been called uh, to preach. And so I, I was uh, active in bringing peace in that situation. Mm. I, uh, from that time on, I committed my life to trying to uh, be a peacemaker and trying to help uh, people to relate to one another across uh, the lines of race because when people start fighting everybody loses there are no winners mm. in fights everybody loses so that's how i got on this journey and uh, have been on it ever since and hope to stay on it until my last breath is taken yeah well thank you jerry and uh, i would never uh, question your integrity, but you've got enough preacher in you. I wanted to make sure that that uh, Timberlake wasn't part of a preacher story there. <laughs> no, it's actually true. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I also want to point out that for those of us in, in the white community, sometimes the civil rights movement can feel like ancient history. I mean, we can put it way back with the the Romans and the Greeks, if we're not careful and thinking that it happened that long ago. But But Jerry lived through it. My parents lived through it. This is one generation away. And I think for persons of color, we need to acknowledge that this is very close and very ongoing. And it should be for us too. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Doug, what about you? Would you give us a little fuller introduction of yourself and kind of include what led you down this path of racial healing? Sure. Well, I guess you could say my experience early on is the, uh, how to say this, mm. the white experience in mm. the South. I was born in Tuscumbia, Alabama, as you know, yeah. Northwest Alabama, 1952. Mm. 
And uh, the first notions I guess I had consciously of the racial structures, the expectations, the way things were, were some of the news broadcasts at the beginning of the civil rights movement. Mm. And um, my family had been part of Churches of Christ for generations mm. and very, very much part, very uh, many, many leaders and committed members, Christians in Churches of Christ, but you have to say white Churches of Christ. Yeah, yes. Because um, when, it's one of those language things again, isn't it? When you say an American, the standard American is a white person. Mm -hmm. So you have to say African American or Chinese American for other people who are just as much Americans. Yes. All of those things were being formed in me unconsciously yeah. as a young white person. All of the uh, stereotypes and the assumptions, all of the kinds of attitudes toward black brothers and sisters um, were very much just part of the way things were. I remember Jerry mentioned the Eyes on the Prize series, that first set from PBS many years ago. Mm -hmm. And I remember in the very first episode of that, they, were, they interviewed a white woman, I think it was in Birmingham, and a black man. And both of them said the same thing. Mm -hmm. We just assumed this was the way God made things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is the way it was supposed to be. And that's the way I grew up. And mm -hmm. so the fact that we could go to the church, the black church in Sheffield, Alabama, when Marshall Keeble would come, uh, some of the white brethren, to hear him, because that was, that was the thing to do. Yeah. But you'd better not expect any black brothers and sisters to be coming over to our congregation when we had a gospel meeting. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't be allowed in. And it was just... It was just, just the way it was. It was just the assumption. And so I think that I was, I was clearly formed in that system that all of us are formed in. I mean, the system's not gone. We're all still formed in that system. And I, I'm not really sure where the journey to allyship, I guess you'd say, yeah. with Black brothers and sisters began. I suppose it began maybe in college in Nashville when I began to have contact with people uh, that were not like exactly like me, but, but to be able to have more contact at a meaningful relationship level. Uh, and I know it's not just an individual thing. I know that this, this is a systemic issue, but it, for me, I, I believe the entree began through personal relationships. And I know that's been true with my relationship with Jerry. He's been a massive mentor, uh, an example for me for, for many years, ever since we've been together uh, at ACU and so forth. But as time went on, as I was at Lipscomb for several years and then moved to Abilene in 1991, mm. these things, for whatever reason, and I'm not really totally sure all those reasons, began to be very, very, very heavy on my heart. And so I got a grant one summer from ACU to develop a curriculum, actually, for teaching. Um, at the time, I was using the term white privilege mm. to, to students and developed uh, a fairly extensive curriculum. I, the only place I ever got to teach it was with the college group at the church where I'm now an elder, the Mentor Lane Church of Christ. Yeah had about 50 college students, and it was really, really amazing. Uh, you know, 98% of those people were white. Yeah. And uh, a couple of Hispanics, a couple of black uh, brethren, uh, sisters. And I remember one day, actually the second session, there was an unrest in the group. I guess they were maybe a little afraid of me, I, you know, teacher, professor at ACU. They, they weren't saying anything to me directly. So I called aside a young man, a Hispanic young man, and I said, what's, what's going on? Something's not right. Mm. He said, They're all saying you're, you're, you're trying to make them feel guilty about being white. Mm. And so we had to reframe the whole thing. This is not about making anybody feel guilty about mm. who they are in the sense of what they are. God made them, but it's about all of us 
understanding the kinds of systems that have shaped us and 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 form the the reactions that we have almost unconsciously toward other people. Mm -hmm. That was a that was a lesson to me. And then Jerry and I uh, began leading a group on the campus at ACU quite a number of years ago. I'm not really sure now how many years ago. We called it United by Faith. Mm. Uh, faculty, staff, students, administrators, small, fairly small group, but we met in each other's homes. We told our stories of race to each other. We grew in our love and respect for each other. Mm. And while people came and went through the years because students would graduate, faculty would go to other, other places, so forth, um, we had a core of people and that, that remained together. And we did quite a number of things. I think Jerry would agree uh, with the Abilene community and with the ACU community that really made an impact that continues to grow. There's a long way to go. Yeah. Uh, I'll just say this now. I will not ever, no white person will ever be fully there in mm -hmm. the in the understanding but as we grow together as we strive to together to break down the evil that's that exists mm -hmm. and realize in the first place for many of us that it's actually there i think that's going to be a massive massive thing and that's part of my journey yeah yeah jerry were you gonna add something or were you just uh active listening with doug uh actively listening with doug I yeah agreement with what he has shared yeah yeah great uh, and i want to point out doug what you said to me is so important foundationally as white people recognizing that we all have racism bound in our heart regardless of how hard we work to get it out it is a lifetime journey and i, I know how i feel that every time i feel like i've gotten to the bottom of it it feels like there's another trap door that exposes a whole new cavern that I've got to, to work out. So thank you for, for saying that. We're going to move now into the questions that I, I have for, for you guys. And when we originally scheduled this interview, it was kind of in the wake of the shooting of Ahmaud Arbery becoming more public. You know, that became very public and was on the news cycle. And I was even noticing, because this is going to come into our questions too, there's a pool in our society and, and media to kind of move us past these things quickly. And I was already noticing that feeling of we're already moving past this. And then Monday, uh, we learned and saw the video of the murder of, of George Floyd. So now we're dealing with, initially we were going to be talking about our reaction to the death of Ahmaud Arbery, and now we have George Floyd added to this as well. So Doug, I'm going to start with you, and this is relatively open-ended. Just tell me about your reaction to these two killings. How did it impact you and how did the reactions of others impact you? I think there's several things I could say. I mean, uh, I suppose the expected response would be mm. horror, mm. Uh, disgust, anger. And I suppose that that's true, that there was some of that. But, but on the other hand, quite frankly, and it's not just those two. Mm, yes. I mean, every week yes. for the last months, mm. there has been a person that has been killed, I think in every case by police, mm. who, they're, they're, it makes no sense. Um, I'll say something else about this term in just a moment, but unarmed black man is a code word mm. that, that says more than what the words themselves say. Mm. The fact of the matter is, while, while there's horror and while there is anger, on the other hand, quite frankly, this is what the system is intended to do. Mm. Mm. That's just the way things are supposed to happen, the way the system is set up. Mm. Mm. And um, I think that people of goodwill, not people who consciously 
And that's part of the, the, the frightening and evil thing about white supremacy. It's not so much that we've consciously chosen to be racist white supremacists, that is, those of us who are white, but uh, we're, we, we've been formed in these kinds of ways. And so I read an article recently about that terminology, unarmed black man. Mm. Okay. <laughs> well, it's true. Mm. The people who have been killed, uh, Breonna Taylor, the woman who was shot in her own home, in her own bed, mm. uh, none of these people were posing a threat. None of these people were, were themselves. Uh, but, but when the term unarmed black man is used, mm. it basically sets things up almost to the point, and this is what, this is what language does subtly, mm. not even realizing it, to say, well, this is different from normal, ordinary black man. Mm. <laughs> Statistically, the reality is that, mm. that white men yeah. are, are actually armed uh, much more. We can get into a, a lot of stuff there, but what I'm trying to say is there's so much that is, that's involved. My personal response was... Um, anger and disgust, but on the other hand, just saying it's just more of the same. Mm. And quite frankly, if we, if we could dig a little deeper into it, if we could go back and at, start seeing some things here and there that didn't make the national news, maybe mm. we'd see the same kind of thing over and over and over again. And for most white people, mm. there's an initial, I mean, white people of goodwill, Christian, there's an initial shot, but as you mentioned a few minutes ago, Grant, mm. the news cycle moves things on out of the way. And, yeah. and by the way, uh, it's not so much, uh, you know, they need to do something about those, those corrupt police officers and, mm. and, and so forth, but that's just a handful, right? Yeah. It's just one or two bad apples. Mm. And if they get those guys out and everything else will be okay, that's not true. Mm. That's not true. The fact of the matter is a lot of people who are not malicious, who are not of evil intent consciously, mm. who are not out going from day to day saying, okay, I'm going to go out and see what person of color I can harass or, or kill today. Mm. It's, the, it's, it's the, the knee jerk reactions. Mm. It's the deeply embedded assumptions that we have that are not even sometimes conscious in the minds of the people. Um, uh, let me just read one little passage from a book that I'll, uh, I would really recommend mm. uh, for everybody. It's uh, called White Fragility. Mm. Most of us would not choose to be socialized into racism and white supremacy. Unfortunately, we don't have that choice. Mm. While there is variation in how these messages are conveyed and how much we internalize them, nothing could have exempted us from these messages. Mm. Mm. I think that's the key, that this is, this is something that is more than personal response in the sense of my being outraged. Yeah. It's something that has to be grappled with, accounted for, at a level that is much, much bigger than any of us. And we're not going to get there until we realize that that's the case. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Doug. And, and I think of what is hitting our, our news cycles, but also how many of these events that may, may even not end up in a death that are happening on a regular basis. It's kind of like Will Smith, who would ever thought Will Smith would have a prophetic voice, but like Will Smith, said racism is not getting worse it's only getting filmed and i think that there's a lot of truth to that and also i, I would like to point out that these shootings were involved uh by police or police with people with police backgrounds but the mcmichaels in particular uh, were not police and one of them had a, had a background in law enforcement but that is a spirit of vigilanteism that has also run wild that, that we saw if we go back to, to Trayvon Martin and you know the death of Trayvon, Trayvon Martin, where 
white people can take on this heroic view. And I think too of your language of unarmed black, unarmed black man, the assumption that black men are criminals that are in their neighborhoods. So it is within all of us, right? It is within all of us, not, not just it is, it is structured within the way that our unconscious bias reacts to people and that impacts good hearted Christian police officers, but it also impacts good hearted Christians like us too that may have an initial reaction that we're just out saving the day. We've got to be really thoughtful of that too. What about you, Jerry? Same question, just your reaction and, and how it impacted you and how the reaction of others impacted you as well. Well, I'm learning how to distinguish uh, between uh, what Stephen Covey would call reacting and responding. Um, as I've seen these brutal actions taken, taken against uh, men and women of color, mm. um, my response has been to go uh, deep within um, the closet of prayer and, and reflection and meditation. Um, being still and uh, looking at how my own formation has been distorted by white supremacy and racism mm. and recognizing that not only has white supremacy taught white people to hate black people, white supremacy has also taught black people to hate black people. Mm. Mm. And so there is all most a spirit of self-negation that has been uh, rooted and grounded in the being of black people that live in this country who have been told from day one of their lives that they are less than human. Mm. Um, they are only here because they are hands and not minds hands to be used in the fields. And now that uh, there's no longer a need for black physical labor, mm. uh, who needs the Negro? Mm. And so uh, as I have thought deeply uh, about uh, these killings, I've come to the conclusion that white America has never accepted Africans in America as fully human nor as full citizens. Mm. And I would say, for the most part, Christians in particular uh, have been complicit. Uh, the white church has been complicit in its silence. Uh, the white church, white Christians have been complicit in their support mm. of political leaders who have played the race card. Mm. Uh, and have baited uh, men and women who are part of the white supremacist community. Mm. And, um, and so there's blood on the hands of, of white Christians in America. That blood, there's blood on the hands of the white church who mm. will sit silently in their pews and know that there are political leaders who are stoking the flames of, of bitterness and hatred towards people of color and they say nothing. Mm -hmm. Every white knee in America was mm -hmm. on the neck mm -hmm. of that man who was murdered mm -hmm. in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. And until the church begins to speak prophetically uh, and begin to hold its pol uh, Christian politicians accountable, when uh, we know a lot of these Christian politicians, mm -hmm. you know, they, they attend our churches, Mm. Uh, they, they, they are part of our families and, and we let them off the hook mm. while, they, while they are backing uh, this kind of, of white hateful mentality. Mm. Mm. And so that, that, that's my uh, responsive reaction. Mm. And, uh, and I'm grateful 
for the practice of being still and thinking mm. uh, about these types of things as opposed to uh, giving a knee-jerk reaction. But um, everybody has not um, you know, been able to practice that on a consistent basis. Uh, some people react in violence and mm. uh, hiding. Um, but uh, that, that, I would just leave it at that. That's my initial uh, response uh, to uh, what I have seen over the past few days. Yeah. Mm. Doug, you were you wanted to comment some more. Just wanted to say in, in support of what Jerry has just said that the fact of the matter is historically that white supremacy as an ideology, hmm. we've got to make sure that we don't confuse something here. White supremacy, a lot of times white, white people, quote, good white people like me, when you hear the word white supremacy, you think of these you know, crazies that are fringe and, and so forth. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the notion that white, the white civilization, that white people are superior, therefore supreme and should be uh, in charge of things. That's mm -hmm. the attitude. That attitude, that, that ideology, if you want to use that term, was created and is sustained by white Christians. Mm -hmm. Historically, mm -hmm. the documentation is clear. Mm -hmm. I've done work on this. There's a book also that's out by Ibram Kendi who sort of traces the history of the notion Stamped from the beginning is the title, but I just wanted to reinforce what Jerry said, that uh, white supremacist ideology was created by and is sustained by, primarily, white Christians, those who claim to be Christians, and I'm not denying that they're Christians. I think that part of what's going on is that there is a plausible deniability because they're just simply partly not aware. Yeah. But that doesn't excuse the evil that's there. Yes. Yeah. And I'm probably stealing some of either or both of your words and what I'm about to say, but it's important to recognize that racism in and of itself is part of the powers and principalities. Yeah. And they shape us subconsciously. They shape the way that we think in the world, the way that we move in the world. And it is a powerful force. And it's also important to note that it infects good people. It infects the best of us. If you feel this conversation that we're having as an indictment on who you are, you're still made in the image of God, but we are all flawed. And we all have a deep responsibility to root this out. So I just want to point that out, that it is out there in the structure that we live in, working against who we are. And we have to be willing to deal with it. And we have to be willing to, to dig deep. The next question I have, uh, and I'm going to start with you on Jerry, uh, with you on this, Jerry, because you walk in both worlds. Um, you speak at a lot of white churches, you grew up in uh, predominantly black churches, but you speak, and, and I want to say, too, that you, you love people so well. You love white people so well. I know that because I've felt that, and it's not that I feel like I'm special. It's that I just feel like you're just so good at, at helping people feel loved. So the question that I have for you walking in both of these worlds is, is really a two-part question. Number one, how do our black Christians, you know, our people of color in our, our black churches, how do they perceive the reaction of white Christians and, and white churches? Mm -hmm. I think uh, based on many, many conversations that I've had with individuals and also in the context of, of group discussions, um, I think a good number of African Americans feel uh, that white people just don't care mm. about black people. Mm. That uh, it's like two different worlds. Um, there's a feeling that uh, lip service has been mastered mm. 
in being able to espouse theories of, of, of unity. Um, but when you look at the practices that are in use, they contradict the espoused theories. Uh, and so um, I think the feeling is that we are viewed as white America's enemies. Mm. That we are viewed as the domestic uh, uh, enemies of the state. Mm. And <laughs> if anybody has a right to be angry and to identify others as enemies, mm. uh, it should be those people that have been enslaved mm. um, and oppressed for 400 years. Mm. Uh, but I would just say to my white brothers and sisters, look at our track record. Mm. We have fought in your wars. Mm. We have served uh, in your police uh, departments. We have led in, 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 in your government. We have been over backwards trying to prove uh, that we hold no animosity towards our white brothers and sisters for mm. our 400 years of oppression. Mm. But there is something in you, my white brothers and sisters, uh, to where you fear that if we are given any ounce of power over you, mm that we will retaliate and do to you what uh, the black South Africans are doing to the white South Africans in South Africa today. Mm. But you have to remember that uh, we for years have practiced to the best of our ability to respond uh, in the most loving way that we knew how to respond. But the provocation must stop. Mm. The provocation must stop. Um, I would say that some of the African Americans that we've been in conversation with, we understand what Mr. Putin is up to. Mm. We know that Vladimir Putin uh, in his intelligence community, they have targeted uh, African Americans mm. um, and using hate groups to stir up uh, resentment and anger in our community. Uh, towards police officers and other white people. Mm. We understand that. But we need white America to understand that we're not the enemy. Mm. Uh, Russia and Mr. Putin, mm. that's their agenda. The, the Intelligence Committee in the Senate have already received reports from uh, the intelligence community and from Homeland Security uh, that this is their tactic during an election year is to uh, stoke racial hostilities in this country. Mm. And so I, I would say that that, you know, we are not the enemy. <laughs> we, we, we are just tired of being treated as such. Uh, we just want to live and be at peace like everybody else, mm. but continue being stepped on, shot down like wild dogs in the street. Um, I just don't know how much more people can take of that. I, mm. I think we're at a breaking point, really. So that's, that's what I'm picking up in my conversations with individuals and with groups, uh, that this, this kind of treatment will not be allowed to continue mm. much longer. And it may, this may be uh, the very event uh, that triggers that kind of uh, mindset to come even out more in the public. Mm. Where? I'd like to point out too that this idea of, of Russia stoking division, that's not a conspiracy theory. That's been documented where mm. they have infiltrated and created Facebook groups yes. of two different people and even planned meetings for them to meet, have rallies in the same place, hoping that they would fight each other, hoping yes. for violence to erupt. That's that has right. happened on multiple occasions, documented. So absolutely, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for that, Jerry. Doug, for you, I want to frame this question a little bit differently, using your word earlier as an ally that has grown up predominantly in white churches of Christ and has attended predominantly white churches of Christ. 
what have you noticed about white Christians and churches and their reaction to these shootings in particular and racism in general? Well, I think that the, the only word that I can say is silence. Mm. Mm. I mean, when you start thinking in terms of, I mean, the, the list could go on and on and on, couldn't it? Our own brother in Churches of Christ, Abotham John, mm. um, being killed in his own apartment. You know, when several uh, meetings took place with people who had been part of that congregation in Dallas where he was a member and concerned people talking with each other about what could be done. And, and it, it was pretty clear in the conversations that I heard that there wasn't a single black church, mm. probably not just churches of Christ, mm -hmm. who the Sunday after that came out, that it wasn't prominent in mm -hmm. their worship service and the prayers and naming the things that were going on specifically. If you tried to find how many white churches, predominantly white churches of Christ, said anything about it whatsoever, mm. you know, this is not, this is simply anecdotal because I didn't try to go to every white church in the state of Texas or something mm. and get an account. Mm. But none of the churches that, that I knew of and none of the churches of the people that came together at that racial unity meeting in Dallas that we had uh, some weeks after his uh, Botham John's death, none of those white churches, apparently, they said it really wasn't part of our service. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of thing that you see, the difference. Mm -hmm. uh, for white Christians, for the most part, and I know there are exceptions, yeah. but for the most part, the attitude, this is not our problem. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we don't like that he got killed, but this is not our problem. This is a, 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 a fluke. This is something that is out of the ordinary. Well, it's not. It's part of what the system is set up to do. Mm. And white Christians, for the most part, just pretty much are silent about it. Mm. Now, that's changing in certain places. Jerry and I are part of an, an ally group. Many of those members, it's a small group, but many of them are preachers in churches of Christ that have influence. And that's beginning to change in some significant ways. And Jerry might even speak to that later. But, but for the most part, it's not, it's not our problem. It's not the white church's problem at all. Mm. In fact, a, a dear friend of ours, of Jerry and mine, who is a, a deacon at a predominantly, he, he's an African-American man. He's a deacon at a predominantly white church of Christ, um, led a closing prayer. Yeah after Botham John's death. And it was, it, all it was saying was, you know, give, give us peace and mm. comfort and, and, you know, comfort the family and, and that there'd be justice that would be done. He was assaulted by the minister mm. and other members, white members, after that was over, that he should not be bringing up politics in the prayers mm. of the church. This is not politics. Mm. This is not politics in some sort of, um, partisan pol political agenda. This is about Christians mm. who, because of what they have seen and the horrible things that have happened, and again, not because of just this very unusual situation or some fluke occurrence. This is, this is the system. Mm -hmm. And to simply ask God to intervene is not on the, it, it, it is off the agenda, is off the the things that are acceptable in a church. Mm, mm. Uh, it's just astounding, but this is the way that, it, that my experience has seen it. Mm. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And I know that I've noticed, and maybe to your point, Jerry, you may want to add to this or not, but you, I even notice our preachers that have an audience and um, a wide audience and, and influence, I notice mm -hmm. when they're silent on these. Yeah. And I imagine it's not on my radar as much as it is our brothers and sisters of color. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I think 
I think the silence in the pulpit has led us to the current social crisis that we see unfolding in the streets of America today. Um, when we talked about this issue in 2008 at the Pepperdine Lectureship mm. uh, on the topic of two houses in a storm, mm. I tried to paint a picture of what could possibly happen in this country if Christians uh, did not become more vocal mm. and more active in seeking to make peace mm. uh, in a time where we had somewhat of uh, a state of social tranquility, uh, if we could call it that. Mm. Uh, there were people that were resistant to that message back then, mm. uh, punished those who would speak up and speak out mm. uh, uh, about matters related to race and racism and uh, oppression. And so um, those voices that sought to speak up and speak out uh, you know, they were attacked. There was backlash. And so how can the pew be informed if the pulpit has been cowered down mm. in a state of silence? Mm. And mm. so even some of our, our leaders, uh, you know, fired preachers because mm. uh, they addressed the issue of race and racism. Mm. And so now we are at a a point in the country where you have no credible Christian voice mm. that can stand out mm. and call for peace yeah. because the church has lost its credibility in the eyes of the American society. Yeah. Yes. And so this is, this is where we are and how we got here is uh, most of the prophets left the pulpit. Mm transition from being prophets to being priests and caretakers mm. of a comfortable social mm. club. Mm. And uh, while the streets were, were filling up with anger and bitterness and hostility, mm. reaching a point to where nobody would be able to reason with our populace. Mm. And so that's how we got to where we are now. And I just pray that God will give us one more chance to, mm. uh, to, to bring about some type of, social cohesion because we are a divided house and that's being exploited even more so today than it ever has been. Yeah. And this time we've got both sides that are well armed hmm. assault weapons hmm. and no national guard and no police department can get in the middle of that hmm. without being shot at uh, hmm. as well. So, this is where we are, and this is what happens when uh, we cannot face the hard truth about our own indoctrination of, of hatred towards people because of their color or their race. Um, uh, so Christians going to have to really right. step it up and, and get tough in this thing <laughs> and look inward and, and look at what we carry in ourselves that's contributing to the chaos and the rioting and the violence that we see spiraling out of control mm -hmm. in the midst of a pandemic on top of that. Yep. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Well, and this is real. We all know preachers who have been fired. I know some that had been fired within this year because yep. they were willing to speak into this at predominantly white churches. And, and what this also illustrates is how out of step that we can be with what's going on. This is baseline cultural morality for our general society. Yes. And this impacts the health and vibrancy. People that are outside of the church, when they see us acting and reacting this way, there is no way they're coming into our doors. Mm -hmm. And we have to recognize this is one of the sad things is that our general culture that is really, you know, that they don't have it together. There's a lot of things that obviously they don't have it together, but our general societal feeling mm -hmm. is further advanced than our, than our churches and closer to the gospel, I would add, too. You guys feel free to push back on me if I overstated any of that, but that's, that's my feeling right now is that this is not just, it is a gospel issue first and foremost, 
but it's also a viability issue for us in the future. Yes. Yeah. I think one thing I heard that I haven't been hearing before uh, in these in types of incidents is that now uh, police officers that do the, the shootings and the killings, mm. uh, that home address is being put on, in mm. social media mm. where their wives work where their children go to school, mm. uh, where they attend church. Uh, there are people even talking about becoming more strategic in the use of violence. Mm. Instead of uh, burning uh, and riding in the cities, uh, they're talking now about going into the neighborhoods where the police officers live. Mm. And this is the state that we're in now, you know, when we, uh, uh, think that the rioting is going to be confined to the, to the hood, to the inner city, that they're going to burn up their own uh, neighborhoods, that thinking has changed. Mm. And so Christians who have been able to live, live comfortably in their nice neighborhoods, uh, untouched by the rioting in the inner cities, you won't long be able to experience that kind of peace uh, and disconnect. From the, from the violence that you see on the television screen. It's mm. coming close to home and mm. may end up in your home. Mm. This is the thing that we've been trying our best to get ahead of uh, and to let people know that uh, there are people who have been trained in guerrilla warfare. Mm. Uh, and if you trip the, the switch and people cross that line of violence, they develop an appetite to where they can't get enough mm. Mm. until uh, the last person has been carried out that they have animosity targeted upon. Mm. And that's true for both sides. And so Christians cannot afford to sit comfortably by and remain silent unless you're willing to live in a society where you have to be under permanent shelter in place because you can't go outside without somebody taking a shot at you. Mm. Mm. That's the kind of uh, society that we're headed towards. We've been, we've been talking that for quite some time, telling people that we could get to that point, but it was mm. hard to believe. Uh, but here we are. So Christians got to step it up again. We got to step it up because people are becoming more uh, strategic in how they express their violence. It's not just, you're not going to just see people throwing bottles at police officers on, on the news. Uh, that stuff is going to eventually spread out of the inner city into neighborhoods. And that's why we can't afford to be uh, quiet and silent on this. We got to speak up and take actions now and call for peace. Uh, not only in our words, but in our actions as well. Yes. And, and I think that it's, it's one of these issues that now it's reached a boiling point to even people that haven't noticed this before are noticing it. And I want to point especially toward, you know, our policemen that care deeply about these issues and are con concerned and privately would express that too often have been silent publicly. And I'm thankful to know, even at our church, really great police officers here. But now I think of the text, I don't know if you saw it, that the police chief in Chattanooga said about the, uh, the, the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis, that now we're seeing our law enforcement officers, hopefully, and hopefully there'll be more that will, will stand up and, and call this out. But I think the shame is at, at the church, we cannot let the, the rest of society lead this charge. This should be our charge. Right. And we have let too many people co-opt that from us. I'm going to move to the, the last question. I'm going to start with you, Doug. And we've talked a lot about the situation culturally and, and how we've reacted and how we haven't reacted. But what I want to point our attention to now, and we pointed this out at the beginning of this conversation, is that the news cycle wants to push us through these things quickly. And I felt it myself with Ahmaud Arbery. How can we as churches withstand this cultural moment 
right? Because I think, and this is my feeling, I've noticed people that normally have stayed out of this conversation are in it right now. And I thank God for that. But how can we stay in this past the cultural moment and help transform our churches from vehicles of racial harm to vehicles of racial healing? That's a, a great way of phrasing the question, Grant. I really appreciate the way that you, you've put that. Okay. You know, um, I'm an educator, Jerry's an educator, and we both know that it's absolutely crucial for people to be thoroughly informed and educated. Yeah. And I know that's not the end of it. Mm. I, I know that that is not all, because you can have people that, that know a lot of stuff, yeah. and are still not transformed. Right. But it seems to me that, number one, we've really got as Christians to understand that this is, I like the way also that you said it, Grant, this is a gospel issue. Mm -hmm. This is not about whether you're this party, this political party, or that political party, or this kind of uh, political persuasion or another. This is about what it means to reflect the image of Christ. Yes. This is about how God wants, and this is using Martin Luther King's terminology, the beloved community. Mm. I know that can be trivialized, but, but this is something that, that is really at the heart. I mean, if you had to push me, I, I think, mm. to to say what what is the one word mm. that would that would encapsulate the gospel mm. and obviously there, there can't just be one but if you were to push me and to say you have to choose one <laughs> mm -hmm. i think i would choose reconciliation mm. now the term racial reconciliation has been corrupted and ruined yep. for a lot of people yeah people who are anti-racist yeah and they will not use it because they, they, it's been trivialized, basically. Mm. Uh, reconciliation at the popular level in most people's minds would mean that uh, you've done something wrong, I've done something wrong, and so let's agree to, to put those things aside and get back together. And that's not what we've got here. Yeah. And, uh, that's not what we've got here at all. Uh, black people did not create white supremacist systems ideology yeah. why did people created that yep um and i i can't let go of the term reconciliation however because it is so central to the gospel mm -hmm. but to rehabilitate re the term reconciliation in the context of racial reconciliation the two pieces that i think are absolutely crucial and it has to start in our churches mm -hmm. is that we're going to have to become thoroughly thoroughly cognizant, educated, mm. sensitized mm. to the realities of the white supremacist ideology and systems that, that operate. Uh, we're going to have to look at history. We're going to have to look at theology. We're going to have to look at sociology. Now, you know, somebody might say, well, he's saying everybody has to go out and get a PhD and <laughs> all this stuff. No, I'm not saying that. But I am saying that we've got to become informed yes. as white Christians and as, as all Christians, really. Yeah. Because as Jerry alluded to a few minutes ago, white supremacy has an effect on everybody. Yeah. It's not just on, on white people or just on persons of color. It's, it's, it, it affects everybody. And it's detrimental because it is corrosive. It is evil. It is insidious. Mm. And it is mostly invisible. Yes. And this makes white people very, very uncomfortable. The very conversation, and you've said it several times even already in the recording, to the folks that will be listening to this, if you feel you know, angry or you, you feel you want to push back, we're not talking about good people versus bad people. Yes. We're not saying that all white people are bad people. I would have to say, and again, um, I'll read from this, uh, this book, White Fragility, 
white supremacy does not refer to individual white people and their individual uh, intentions or actions, mm -hmm. but to an overarching political, economic, and social system of domination. Mm -hmm. Now, again, a lot of uh, good-hearted white people who are not antagonistic, who are not mean, they're not evil people. They're mm -hmm. good people. Yeah. It's like, well, you know, that's not me. I'm not racist, and therefore, I'm, I'm a good person, therefore, I'm not racist, or vice versa. I'm not racist, therefore, I'm a good person, and so this doesn't apply to me. No. Hmm. Everybody is, is shaped, is socialized, is formed, even at the unconscious level, in a thousand ways, by these white supremacist ideas. And I think that that's the first piece in reclaiming a biblical concept, a gospel concept of reconciliation. And we've got to stop being so fragile as white people that we can't talk about this. And, uh, you know, a lot of times our immediate response is, well, you're just a, a, a liberal po politically, or you're just a, a right wing person mm -hmm. politically. No, you might be, I don't know. But is there nothing that you can talk about that is so central to the heart of the gospel and so central to what Christ would have and to the beloved community that, yeah. that you just label it, you can just dismiss it as a political agenda? I just don't think so. Yeah. Second piece has got to be repairs. Yeah. And, uh, and there's where you get into some real nitty gritty hard stuff. Yeah. But um, Jerry and I have thought a lot about these things. We, we've talked about them, uh, written about them, and so forth. But uh, I think that, that you've got to form in your churches ally groups. Yes. Some people who are already sympathetic, I guess you might say, who already have a sense that there's something here, uh, perhaps to start with that kind of, uh, of group, hopefully uh, among the leaders especially, although very often there is a resistance at the leadership level, but, uh, but then to, to have the congregation learn about these things and then begin to say, what can we actually do? What can we say, but what can we do mm -hmm. to be on the record as against this evil yeah. as Christians, not because we're this or that politically. Yeah. Yeah. That's, re that's really good, Doug. And I, what you mentioned about education and information is so important. And I should have noted this at the beginning because as, as I was thinking about this, at first I thought that I would have two persons of color to have this conversation with. But then I also thought the optics of this are so important that too often us as white people expect persons of color to explain ourselves to ourselves. And we, as white people, have got to be willing to, to be the ones to confront this. We cannot, Jerry is, is very blessed and he's very gracious in that he has this gift of explaining this well to, to white people, but we cannot put that on persons of color. It's too painful for some of them. We can't just walk up to our friend that is a person of color and, and expect them to be able to tell us their internal reality. We've got to be willing to learn about ourselves and teach ourselves about ourselves as well. So thank you. Thank you so much for that, for that, Doug. What about you, Jerry? What can we do as, as white churches to transform ourselves as Christians and as congregations from being vehicles of harm to vehicles of healing? I think, uh, it will require going back and asking the question to which gospel have you been converted to? Mm, mm, mm. Because the gospel, the biblical gospel of Jesus does not produce white supremacists. It does not produce Christians that will tolerate white supremacy. And so I think uh, it will warrant going back uh, investigating what you really hold to be the gospel. And there, there's more than one gospel. Paul said there's a perverted gospel. Um, and it could be that um, people have bought into a perverted gospel 
uh, assuming that they are actually committed to the gospel of Jesus Christ, the biblical gospel of Christ. Uh, and the only way one can find out is uh, if there is resistance to, uh, to truth about being rightly related to God and being rightly related to your fellow human beings. And I think as Doug was pointing out, reconciliation begins with God first. Yes. Then once you have become united with God, you then are drawn to everyone else who has in them the spirit of the living God. Uh, but you need the gospel. I need the gospel. We all need the gospel mm. to teach us how to become reconciled to God first. Uh, and then the other uh, processes of reconciliation will happen as a, as a natural outflow of our connection to the life of God. We can't we cannot value the lives of other people unless we value first our life as being connected to the creator of life. Mm, mm. And so if you're anti-black, anti-Hispanic, anti-people of color, mm. you're being utilized by the spirit of antichrist. Mm, mm. Because Christ is for uh, for all that God has created. And so only the gospel can give us that kind of light. So I think, uh, and I, I'm very hesitant to say this, but I must say it. Mm -hmm. I think the white church in America has experienced uh, spiritual apostasy, mm -hmm. has been hijacked by a spirit of politics. Mm -hmm. The politics of the kingdoms of this world has taken over. Mm. Uh, and that can be said of many churches, regardless of their racial makeup. Uh, but what we're talking about today, mm. is, I think to a large degree uh, that has happened, uh, which prevents people from really speaking the language of the kingdom of God, as Doug mentioned earlier about the beloved community. Uh, you, you cannot... Uh, speak the language of the beloved community if you are uh, a white isolationist. Mm. You just want a community just for white people and mm. everybody else that's non-white would be excluded from that. That's not the picture of revelation uh, where you know people from all nations of the earth, <laughs> from, from every tongue, uh, that, that beautiful uh, picture that we see painted by John on the Isle of Patmos. So I would say that that's what we have to go back to and ask the question, what have I been converted to? Yeah. Mm, yeah. And I think for those of us in the church of Christ that value scripture so much, yes. we have to ask ourselves, do we believe our scriptures? Right. You know, because right. if we believe our scriptures, then we simply cannot deny that there is need for repentance and yes. there's need for change and there's need for transformation because yes. what is going on within our churches is outside. We can say the word gospel, but if we want to be more clear, we can say scripture too. Do yes. we believe that all of humanity was created in the image of God? Do we believe that, that for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son, the whole world, simple, simple, simple scriptures that even our children know, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, Th th that's a, a simple question. What gospel have we been converted to? Do we believe our scriptures? Thank you so and much for that, Jerry. All, all the false prophets are not in religion. Some mm. of them have uh, talk radio shows. Mm. Uh, some of them are out in the entertainment arena. Uh, they don't have, some of them don't have traditional pulpits, but they are preaching uh, a gospel that people are buying into. And anything that is not of the authentic gospel of Jesus Christ. That is what we in churches of Christ call false doctrine. Mm, yeah. Some of us won't sing with a piano, but we allow people to sing with racial bigotry in their hearts. Mm, mm. And so, uh, you know, we can't just have a right external worship and have a mm. distorted heart wow. in worship. So uh, false prophets are not limited to pulpits. They're everywhere. So, mm. Uh, how many 
hours do you spend listening to talk radio? Mm. Are the messages being uh, promoted on talk radio in harmony with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Mm. I think you'd find a lot of talk radio goes right up against the face of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we have to decide, we're going to listen to those prophets of the world or the prophet Jesus Christ who speaks truth and is truth. And we have to choose. We cannot mix them together. We have to make a decision as to whose voice we're going to listen to, the chief shepherd or other voices that are speaking a message that is not of the kingdom of God. Wow. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, Jerry. That was a word. That was a word there. Well, it's come to time for us to conclude this. It's enjoyable because it's with you two, but it, the topic isn't enjoyable. It's a difficult topic and we can't deny that. Yeah. So I'm going to turn it over, uh, start with you, Jerry, and we'll, we'll finish with Doug. But just if there's anything else that you want to add, and maybe if there's an accessible resource, if, if someone this kind of piqued their interest, maybe the first place you would point them to go. I would just say uh, unplug from a lot of the messages that we are hearing in our world. Mm. Uh, set aside um, a good chunk of time in the day somewhere that's quiet and be still and be alone uh, with God. Mm because that is really going to be the state you're going to be in in eternity, throughout eternity. You will not have white skin or black skin, or all these other physical characteristics. You are in essence spirit. You're not flesh, blood, and bones, essentially. You are spirit. <laughs> and, and when you draw your last breath, you will once again be without form. And I think that in order for us to uh, live responsibly with these physical forms that we call bodies uh, while we are here on this planet, we have to spend a lot of time in the place to which we're traveling to. Mm. And the only way that you can access heaven now mm. is you have to become comfortable with being still and being quiet and alone in the presence of the one who has no form, who is spirit. And if we uh, get comfortable hanging out with God, who is spirit, we begin to see other people as uh, souls and not as physical bodies wrapped in different colored skin. Mm. But we treat them based upon the fact that they are a human spirit, a mm. being mm. Uh, that's deeper than skin color and hair texture and eye color and all those things. All that stuff on the ground will rot away. Mm. Yet we spend so much time allowing our souls to become attached to something mm. that is fading with time. Mm. And so that's what I would leave with us today. Hang out with God, realize that you're more than what you look like in the mirror mm. and that your fellow citizens in this country are more than what they look like in terms of their skin um, and their physical features. They, they're more than that. Yeah. God helps us to see them through uh, God's eyes, through the eyes of Christ, through heaven's eyes. Yeah. Thank you for that, Jerry. Doug, what about you? Is there a parting thought that you'd like to leave us with? Yes, I think so. Other than saying amen, mm. to Jerry's eloquent statement just now, I think that um, We've got to be very careful as Christians to understand that even people who, even white people who at the conscious level mm -hmm. have a commitment to inclusion and um, diversity, if you want to use those kinds of terms, even anti-racism mm -hmm. at the conscious level are still inevitably, not because we've chosen it, but because we cannot escape it in this yeah. country, shaped by the white supremacist reactions, understandings 
that are so pervasive, even in commercials and everything that we see and read and things that come across. And so I think that becoming, being deep in prayer and being deep in prayer, I'm talking about, I'm talking to white people now, mm -hmm. like me, being deep in prayer with brothers and sisters of color mm -hmm. and having people uh, like Jerry has been to me and to others who will speak truth mm. um, and, and not like, frankly, the fact of the matter is, and some people are hurt by this, but I know a lot of uh, white people say, well, I have a lot of black friends and they don't talk about this kind of stuff. They're not, well, so if they did, it would be the only thing they could talk about and they just don't want to, 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 to do that. Mm. They don't want, if they have a, a, at least a cordial relationship with a white person, they don't want to, to, to poison that, mm. Mm. To, to do away with the, what ple pleasant re re uh, relationship that they might be able to have. Mm -hmm. But they also know that white people are so fragile that when you start talking about some of these realities, they're going to, they're going to get immediate pushback. And so I can just imagine that some, some of the listeners to this would say, when Jerry's talking about, you know, hating black people or hating Hispanic people or whatever. And they would say, that's not me. He's not talking to me. Mm. But the fact of the matter is at the conscious level. Mm -hmm. And if uh, you said something about uh, resources, if I'll send you a list of resources that if you want, if you want to share with people, that's fine. But one of them on that book, on that list of uh, books is the book blank. Mm. The title is just simply Blink by Malcolm Gladwell. Mm -hmm. He refers to uh, studies, but especially one, the, the Harvard IAT, which is an online test. Even people who are committed anti-racists because of the socialization that they have received in this country respond in ways that always favor white people. Mm. Black people who take the test always respond overall in ways that favor white people. <laughs> and it's not because they are maliciously haters of persons of color. These are sometimes even committed anti-racists. Mm. But we cannot escape that kind of socialization, even when we're totally unaware of it. Yeah. And that's where I think it's so crucial to, to, like Jerry said, to be in prayer and to be in prayer with brothers and sisters of color who you become so close to that they will speak truth to you mm. and begin to shape and help your understandings so that we as Christians can bring at least a, a glimpse of that beloved community mm. here on earth, mm. that kingdom of God in its fullness, even here on earth. Mm. Wow. Thank you for that, Doug, and for Jerry, and for this conversation, and I just want to thank you for the frank nature of the conversation. This has been very candid, and I think when we're talking about how to love people better, mm. we ought to be really bold about that, yeah. um, and so I, I just appreciate both of your, your boldness and your, uh, the candid nature of this conversation, so thank you so much for this time together. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoyed being with both of you together today and we'll continue. That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. That's right. God bless. And, and thank you everybody for, for listening. And, and um, I'll have resources available. I, I'll make sure that if you want the list of resources that Doug mentioned that you can get them. He gave them to me a while back. He may have added, I'm sure knowing Doug, he's probably added some since the last version of that that I got. So I'll make sure that you get resources and look, let's again, let's make sure that we're committed to this together, that we are in this to love people better and to live out the gospel in a way that screams to our world. We're yeah. people that love the people that God loves. Right. Right. That's right. it. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Take care. <laughs>